evolution teaches that energy, such as lightning or heat, plus matter, can occasionally create new life. Yet our entire food industry rests on the fact that this can never happen. If we examine a jar of peanut butter, it contains matter and is exposed to light and heat. But we never find new life inside unless an outside life contaminates it. If the theory of evolution was viable, then I should, occasionally, by subjecting this to energy, end up having new life. Now we go down to the store, and um, if, if I open this jar of peanut butter, maybe not often, but on some occasion, I should find new life inside. And so, when we open the jar of peanut butter, we look in there, there's no new life. <laughs> and aren't you glad, okay? Okay, uh, for the next section in our video, we're going to talk about uh, specialization and what Ortega thinks specialization has done to society or over-specialization has done to society. He starts, this is what, chapter 11? 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. So first, before we start, though, let's make sure that there are no misunderstandings here. This is going to be his first critique of science. Yeah. So science is going to be critiqued here, but this is not your typical critique of science in the sense that he tampered in God's domain, which is like the critique of science in these sci-fi movies. Scientists always poking into regions they're not supposed to poke into and the mysteries of the universe. That's not what this is about. This is not about scientists doing too much. The critique of specialization is the critique that science, I guess in a, in a stupidly simple way, science is such a complicated field. Any field inside of science is so complicated that even within specific fields you have to specialize in one certain small portion of that specific field. For example, you know, for doctors people can spend their entire lives working on the nose. That's it. That's what you spend your entire life researching and looking into. The nose. And that's all. Uh, so you get these people that are very, very highly educated in one factor of one, one, one area of one of their sciences. But that's it. Yeah. However, because they're well educated in one field, they get the impression that that allows them to talk authoritatively about other fields, other fields that are completely unrelated. So, okay, at first this scientist seems ludicrous, right? How could that be? How could that actually happen? But I want to suggest that this is happening all the time in very strange ways. For example, um, Oh, but the term that uh, Ortega uses is the learned ignoramus, right? The learned yeah. ignoramus. This, this comes up even when sometimes in here in conversation. But, um, for example, how about this? The idea that, for example, the scientist as the wise man. Um, for example, Albert Einstein. I have his book up there, his book of, of kind of ideas and opinions and aphorisms. Well, okay. Einstein was a genius in special relativity. That doesn't qualify him to talk about world peace and other philosophical affairs, but he does anyway. Now, I'm not saying he's not qualified. I'm just saying that just because he's a scientist doesn't give him the authority to do that. But we seem to have this idea that scientists are wise men, right? He's almost magical, so that they know about everything else. Or this, but this gets even more sinister, not just a bunch of aphorisms that Einstein had published once or someone published for him. Um, you can see this especially in creationism, I think. Mm -hmm. um, look at all the creationists they pull up to fight evolutionary theory and in biology, right? Um, they always pull up somebody at the end of the stage, and he's a PhD. Um, for example, there's a guy named Jonathan, what, Sarfati. I looked this guy up just today. He's a PhD, and he wrote a book, The Greatest Hoax on Earth, Refuting Dawkins on Evolution. Okay, and people love this guy, apparently. I don't know. Um, he's a PhD, but um, he's a PhD in chemistry. 
he's not a PhD in biology. It, this happens like, I mean, like you often see these creationist scientists get up there and they're PhDs, and then you ask, what are you a PhD in? Mathematics. Yeah. Right? Mathematics. Well, yes. You're good at mathematics. So what? Right? I mean, this this mythos is, is with us today, and it's actually very destructive, I think. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, you know, just weird things people get hung up on, like, oh, you're good at playing chess. So that means, you know, oh, well, let's you know, see if you have some kind of flash memory, right? Like you can instantly memorize things, because you must be, because you're good at playing chess. Right, this has always bothered me, that chess players are smart people. Um, I mean, you have to be smart, a certain, you have to have a certain level of intelligence to play chess, because there's a lot of strategy involved. But just because you're a chess master doesn't actually mean you're qualified to talk about anything other than, for the most part, chess, I'm sorry to say. It's like Joseph Heller described the Olympics, right? You're better at doing something that means nothing to, what did he say? The, 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 the people, the gold medals at the Olympics, are the best at doing something that Matt, that no one else can do. What was it? They're, they're, they're the best at doing what no one else... Oh, man, I lost the quote. Hold on. I forgot it, too. I forgot the quote. But, I mean, basically, they're good at their one skill. That's all I'm yeah. trying to say. I mean... And not to say that to do that one skill doesn't require other skills, but it's I never got these the chess man is the wise man. Um, it goes too far. Yeah. I mean, you know, was was Wittgenstein the world's greatest chess player too, or was Einstein the world's greatest chess player? No, I don't think he was. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, this is just bizarre that, like, because you're specialized in one field, you feel qualified to talk in others. I mean, maybe a little closer to the Internet's near and dear hearts is people that, you know, know about one aspect of video gaming, and they feel qualified to talk about all of it. Mm. Um, not naming names, but, you know, this this is with us. I think it's, it is. And, and the, the worst part is like a general or broad education is laughed at by these people too. Exactly. Because these same people, they laugh at broad education. You're a jack of all trades and master of none. You don't know anything deeply, right? Um, having a general view of the, the, the scene is laughed at. You have to either have very specific nuanced knowledge, very small, minute knowledge of, of very specific things, or nothing at all. Yeah. A general overview is laughed at. And, yeah, people will instantly, when you, you know, even in these book, like books and things like this that propose, like, a general overview of these topics, they're kind of like w the first thing. Well, yes, but uh, actually that's, you know, none of that's true. Because da-da-da-da-da, and then they're like, that's why I'm so much smarter than all of you because I know that this part of the set of stuff is not really as true as you might think. And I can see like where the one upsmanship can get you in there, but it's kind of interesting to think about this in relation to and so Ortega talks about how these people, he what he calls learned ignoramuses, hmm. uh, they they have knowledge, but it's kind of a very strange kind of knowledge. He, that's why he says like they 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 you can't call them ignorant. And you can't call them learned in the classical sense, which is like back in the old days, you, you were just like educated in everything. And the people who weren't educated were just like not educated. Um, it's an interesting, I think this is where we need to make two different words. We need to use two different words in a, with a different sense. We need to divide knowledge from understanding. So I guess I would rather say I think it clarifies matters more to say uh, these people have quite a bit of specialized knowledge. But the question is, do they have understanding? Um, so they know exactly what to do and how all these things work. But what does that knowledge mean in relation to the larger whole of science? It's, it's a mystery. It's a, it's a blank, right? What, what does this mean for the society as a whole? 
it's a mystery, it's a blank, right? I mean, this is how you can get this kind of weird thing where people in labs are researching really, really cool stuff and they're, they're researching really, really cool ideas, but the first thing that happens is they're taken out of the lab and used for, I don't know, all sorts of weird stuff, weaponry and boner pills and, like, because there's no... They, 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 don't, they don't even know, really, like, the, the connection between how this is going to be used in other parts of society. I mean, this is not just science, too. I mean, you could take this outside of science. Like, even in your company, like, how what you do in your company relates to the company as a whole. I mean, that's what they call in companies, they have generalists and specialists. And, you know, when you are sitting in your lab at, you know, Mitsubishi, analyzing this set of chemicals... I mean, how is this gonna? How is how does this relate to all of Mitsubishi? It's not really all that clear, is it? Um, right. I, game game design is done the same way, right? They have programs for specific small bits, but then they have the grand designers too that pull it all together. Yes. And actually make it into a game. Exactly. I mean, it's it's kind of interesting to think about this idea with something Zizek always talks about. Why, if we just take it right up to the modern day, like isn't Zizek, one of Zizek's interesting mantras is uh, where he kind of flips Marx's saying, uh, they know not what they do with, they know what they do, yet they still do it. Wouldn't it be interesting, interesting to reinterpret this statement in the light of this and say, um, for example, these specialist people, I mean, or even us, let's just place us in that situation. We know, we quote unquote know, that what we do contributes to, for example, global warming. But we still do it because we we can't link what we're doing with the larger picture. It doesn't feel like we're doing anything that's contributing to global warming because it's so big. We can't tie those two together. Isn't this, this, this the problem that's happening here with this over-specialization? He, that specialist can't link up what he's doing with the larger picture, so he feels like what he's doing really has no consequence per se. He's just doing, right? Yeah, this is also one of Marx's forms of alienation, too. Yes. Like when you're unable to see the final product or even know what part of the final product you're, you're contributing towards, right? In the end, it actually almost makes you feel... It can have the effect, uh, the effect of making you feel like your work is meaningless in a certain way when you don't know. And, you know, science is often shown as, like, a one scientist making all these great advances, but science is actually done by thousands and thousands of mini-scientists, <laughs> if you yeah. will, doing little experiments, like 10,000 sizes, doing all these little experiments, and then, you know, one guy can take all this data sometime in the future and use it to prove a theory. So on, a, a on a side topic, this is actually something in science called the Ortega thesis. Yes. Um, but, I mean, it, it's a little bit different than what Ortega says in the book. But it, this general idea that, that science is progressed through the work, not of big people, but all these little people working kind of mechanically uh, every day, doing the same process again and again in a highly specialized way, this is what kind of leads us forward and gets the bulk of the work of science done. It's kind of funny because he would totally disagree with that. Yeah. I, he, he personally would disagree with that. But. I mean, I guess what he's saying, and I don't know, this is going to have to be up to the viewer if it's true or not, but um, Ortega would say that now in a world that's becoming more and more complicated all the time, um, for example, Newton didn't have to know much before he could have his universal physics, but... Einstein, he said, had to know Kant and, and, uh, and Newton and a bunch of other people before he could have the next step in physics. Well, if we don't have general, an, a general idea of physics or science in general, how can we exam advance to the next stage of science without a general broad understanding of all what science can do? Right? We need these generalists. We need these guys with the big picture in order to move science on to the next stage. And that's he's, he's suggesting that we're losing those people and we're going to be caught at this stage forever if we're not Careful. Yes. And I, I kind of, I like this critique a lot. I think it, it does, it is food for thought. And on that point, I want to finish up yeah. our talk about specialization. All right.